Well, last week was fine, so. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, today's uh, speaker is Elodie Brotland, who is a postdoc here uh, at DTM. So uh, Elodie got her bachelor's degree in geology from uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon in France. Uh, after that, she, she didn't get two master's degree like uh, it was said in the email. She got one master's degree <laughs> uh, and a PhD in volcanology from uh, University of Clermont-Ferrand. And after that, she went to University of Miami to uh, get a postdoc. And she joined us uh, last September uh, to work with me and Diana uh, here at DTM. So today, she will talk about uh, what we can do with volcano deformation. All right. Can you, can you hear me well? OK. So thanks, Alain, for the introduction. And thanks, everybody, for coming to my talk. We're going to be talking about uh, volcano deformation, which is obviously my favorite topic. And uh, let's start with this. So for people living close to a volcano or for people spending holidays close to a volcano, the main question is, well, when is the volcano going to erupt? And this comes down to several other questions. Is it actually going to erupt? Is there magma down there? How much magma is there down there? And is it close to the surface? And is the crust uh, close to failure? So to try and answer these questions, we can uh, use volcano deformation. So I would separate two types of volcano deformation. First would be, um, sorry, long-term. Um, uh, Long-term deformation, which we characterize by the morphology, the structural and tectonic mapping and observations. And then the short-term uh, deformation that we characterize with mostly with GPS and INSAR. And, um, <clears throat> and so, so we have made a lot of efforts into characterizing volcano deformation. Now the key point is uh, to try and answer these questions, we need some modeling. 
And this is uh, really a growing field. So modeling is a bit like an unexplored planet. Uh, we, we are trying a lot of things. And uh, we have difficulties in modeling that are linked to the fact that uh, the models depend on the time scales of the processes, on the amplitude of the processes, and on the properties of the crust that we don't know uh, really well. Another challenge is also to try and relate long-term and short-term uh, deformation processes, which I'll be talking a little bit about. So the outline of my talk uh, is this one. I'll be first talking about long-term deformation with uh, the process of caldera resurgence. And then I'll move on to short-term deformation with two topics. First one would be investigating volcano interactions, and second one will be what I'm doing at Carnegie, which is evolution of the crust and the edifice uh, mechanical properties. So let's start with uh, resurgence. So caldera resurgence, let's start with a definition. So calderas are large volcanic depressions that are attributed to uh, the fact that when you have a large, very large volume eruption, then you will empty part of your uh, reservoir. And then the roof of the reservoir is not sustained anymore, so it collapses. So you end up with large, uh, more or less circular uh, volcanic de uh, yeah, depressions. And then uh, once it has collapsed, it usually you still have activity going on. And one type of activity is resurgence. This is the long-term uplift of uh, the caldera floor following the collapse. A very famous example of resurgent caldera is uh, Valles caldera, which you can see. So this is the this is the caldera rim here. So you see that the caldera is is uh, slightly elongated in this direction, and uh, you have in the center of the caldera a resurgent dome here that is surrounded by late products, and so this dome is is made of tilted uh, tilted ignimbrite, so tilted. Uh, well, um, tilted deposits, these deposits were formed um, during the caldera collapse eruption. And also, it is, it is uh, crossed by a certain number of faults. Resurgence is a very common phenomenon. Uh, I'm sure in this list you will recognize a lot of calderas that you know about, at least Yellowstone, Long Valley. And here I have put um, two resurgent calderas in, uh, in Italy, so Ischia here and Campi Flegrei, that illustrate the two main types of uh, resurgent structures. So Ischia here, as you can see, it's, it's a block that is uplifted with uh, virtually no internal deformation, and the deformation concentrate on the borders because it's bordered by faults. And then the second type is Campi Flegrei, in which um, you actually have a dome with, uh, with uh, here real flanks and, and, and deformation and, uh, and uh, faults at the, at the top. So as I said, um, so we have different types of structures. Sometimes even the entire caldera can be resurgence, which is the, 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 um, the case at Lake, Lake City. The amplitude goes from a few hundred meters to more than one kilometer. The uplift rate goes from a few centimeters uh, per year, but can go up to several tenths of uh, centimeters per year. Timing can be early or late. For example, we have two resurgent dome in Yellowstone, uh, in Yellowstone, sorry. And so Sour Creek was formed early, and we have lost part of its structure, whereas Marlow Lake Dome is, is um, formed really, really later. The duration goes from a few thousand years to, um, to more than one million year, and the size goes from a few kilometers to a few, uh, a few tens of kilometers. For example, here in Toba, you have uh, approximately 40 kilometers uh, along uh, Resurgent Dome. But there is a common point uh, that most authors agree on is that caldera resurgence has a magmatic origin. So first of all, because of the amplitude and the duration of the process, and also because we have some other kind of proofs. So geological studies of eroded resurg <coughs> resurgent caldera shows intrusions uh, in the middle that can explain the resurgence. And also geophysics uh, can help us. Uh, so we have 
seismic imaging at uh, active calderas. This is an example at Yellowstone that shows that the reservoir uh, kind of has, so it's hard to see with the resolution, but it has kind of has two bumps uh, beneath here, example beneath Marrow Lake Dome. We're also using thermal modeling to prove uh, the renewal of the, of the magma beneath the resurgent calderas. And we are using a combination of gravimetry and deformation uh, monitoring. This was a famous example in Long Valley in which Bataglia uh, conducted uh, such a study to prove the emplacement of new magma beneath the dome. So I just, I just want to say something um, about Calder resurgence is, is complex actually because uh, it, it is on very long time scale. This is a process that happens on very long time scales. And we, with the recent monitoring, we have only access to very short time scales. And uh, what we can see is that uh, actually the formation in Caldera is highly variable. So highly variable in time. If you look at what happens in Compi Flegre, uh, you actually have a series of ups and downs at different time scales. And then if you look uh, at Yellowstone, this, uh, this, uh, these interferograms illustrate the variability in space. So sometimes the whole caldera is, is affected by, um, by deformation. Sometimes it concentrates under a resurgent dome, sometimes under another. It's, it's, really, it's really complicated to try and relate uh, long and short-term uh, deformation. So we're going to look at one example, which is the one that I studied during my PhD. And so this is the Yankai Dome in Tana Island in uh, Vanuatu. So I'm sorry, this, this is in French, but I didn't, I didn't find a, a very, very good figure in, in English. Uh, there must be. Um, anyway, so you see that the Vanuatu volcanic arc is located here. It is uh, in a quite complicated tectonic setting because here to the south, you have the subduction of the Pacific plate beneath the uh, Australian plate. And from Vanuatu and up to the north and, uh, and west, you have the subduction of the Australian plate beneath uh, the Pacific plate. So the inversion here, uh, we think, happened because the Pacific plate, the subduction of the Pacific plate was at some point blocked because the Otong Java Plateau uh, could not enter the, the subduction. Anyway, it is very complicated and it's also very, very uh, active. This is very, very fast convergence with uh, 12 centimeters at the, at the latitude of Tana Island in the, in the southern segment of the volcanic arc. And uh, this convergence, this active convergence, is also linked to a general tectonic uplift that has been um, that has been um, estimated through coral elevated emerged coral terraces. And this is in the range of one to three millimeters per year. So this has no, like this is two orders of magnitude smaller than the kind of processes that we are interested in. So we have here her, uh, her dome, the Yankai dome, which is five, uh, 15 centimeters year. So here is a close-up on Tana Island and uh, you can see here Siwi Caldera. Siwi Caldera was formed during the latest, uh, the latest phase, the latest volcanic activity phase of Tana Island. And this is uh, the, the deposits from the, well, the Ingham right from the, from the Caldera collapse uh, eruption. And uh, so this caldera is, is elongated in shape. It's, it's more or less rectangular. It's open to the sea on, the east, on it, 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 its eastern part, sorry. And uh, it is very active. It has uh, two types of activity. First, volcanic activity with this uh, little ash cone, which is called Mont Yasur, that explodes approximately every two, three minutes. Um, and, uh, and here you can see Mount Yasur. This is a picture taken from the border of the caldera, uh, the northern border of the caldera. And this, this volcano is located on the border of a resurgent dome. So this is, this is what we're interested in. So um, 
you can see on that slope map that uh, this resurgent dome so rises from approximately a flat floor, and uh, it has a typical uh, dome and graben morphology. So it's elongated in the same direction as the caldera, and it, it has a, a actual graben on top. The formation is quite strong. So on the flanks, you can see the tilted ignimbrite up to uh, 70, 70 degrees deep. So this is an outcrop uh, right here. You can see the tilted ignimbrite. Uh, from oral, uh, from sorry, uh, emerged coral terraces, um, uh, the, um, the uplift rate was uh, estimated to be around 15 centimeters uh, per year over at least 1,000 years. And, um, and it has a lot of uh, hydrothermal fe features, so a lot of uh, altered uh, hydrothermal ground, and a lot of fumaroles. So we didn't have uh, much to study the structure of this dome apart from the SRTM DEM, which is not very convenient. So what we decided to do is we decided to do photogrammetry. So we were uh, lucky enough to collaborate with two pilots from uh, Air France that uh, flew this little, uh, very little uh, aircraft all over our zone. And uh, so we also collected on the field some ground control points as much as we could. And uh, we selected all these pictures, like approximately 1,000 pictures in, in, uh, in red here. And then we did uh, photogrammetry from, uh, well, the technique that is now used, widely used, which is, which is called uh, structure from motion. So you, from this, you get a point cloud. You, you, need to, you need to filter it, and you need to, to clean it quite a lot. And then uh, you, get your, uh, you get your 3D model, your surface model, and also, which is very convenient, a very precise ortho image. So just, to, just a comparison between, uh, so this was the SRTM DEM, and this is our photogrammetric uh, digital surface model. So it's a little bit like, it was very blurry, and now you, you kind of put on your glasses. Um, so you can see, so although it's a, it's a surface model, so you cannot get rid of the vegetation, but the vegetation is homogeneous enough, so you can retrieve uh, the faults and the, the offsets. So this is the precise mapping that we did. Uh, so you can see, it's quite complex, actually, because you have a lot of uh, destabilization scars on the, on the eastern face. But you can see quite clearly uh, the graben, the fault of the the faults of the of the graben, um, and you can simplify this uh, down to this approximately. What we were very interested in is is the size of the dome and the size of the graben precisely. So I was talking about a typical uh, dome and graben um, uh, structure because. That's what we observe on a certain number of domes. So here I've talked about Valles Caldera, I've talked about Marla Lake uh, dome uh, in, uh, in Yellowstone. So see again, the, the, the domes are all slightly elongated and then in the same direction you have a linear graben on top. Creed Timber Mountain also has one. Sometimes you have several grabens. It's the case of Toba. Here it's also the case of uh, Long Valley, if you know the resurgent dome. And uh, just, just, uh, just a funny thing, sometimes resurgence is not inside the caldera. It can be bigger than the caldera. So this is just an example in San Juan Volcanic Field in which uh, these two calderas, so Uncompagre Caldera and San Juan Caldera collapsed at the same time. And then there was a resurgence, a super, super resurgence encompassing both uh, calderas and then a, a, a grab and formed in the middle. So even if the size is very different, then the structure is, is very stable. So we wanted to know, well, what, so we can, we can pretty much um, characterize the, the external structure. What, what now about the internal structure and what are the source characteristics? Can we, can we define the depth of the source from, uh, from the external structures? That, that was a question. So we did, um, 
we started by doing some analog modeling. So this is what we were using. So this is a silicone reservoir. Uh, and and for, for practical reasons, it is compressed from the size, but the geometry uh, of the thing uh, transformed the, the, the lateral compression into vertical movement. And, uh, and so then we fill this part with, with sand of different, uh, with layers of different colors to be able to see. Uh, to be able to to see the deformation better, so I'm just gonna play. Uh, the movie. So we start compressing. You see the folds forming in the middle, and then later on these folds will reach the surface. So we we have. Uh, we will create this kind of analog uh, resurgent dome pattern with uh, dome borders that are well-defined and, and the graben in the, in the middle. So if you want to see what it's like. Oh. In, so this is an oblique view, and this is a, a cross-section. So you can uh, well see the faults here, reverse faults, defining uh, the, the domes, which would explain why uh, the domes in nature are pretty well-defined. And, uh, and why do they rise from a pretty flat floor? And then you can see the grab in here and the silicone, so the analog for the magma uh, kind of reaches, well, reaches the tip of the, of the, of the grab in. So depending on the characteristics of your source, you observe actually different types of morphologies. And uh, one very important ratio is the, the width, uh, well, the, the height of the, the sand pack, so the, 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 the depth of your source uh, on the, to, the, to the width of your source. And so for very low ratios, which means for uh, very, um, very shallow sources, we tend to observe uh, several grabbins, so two grabbins, two lateral grabbins. Then when you have a, a thicker sand pack, uh, then you get just one grabbin. And when you, when you thicken and thicken your sand pack again, then you lose, uh, you lose this, this, uh, the clear structure at the surface. So what we can say is that when we observe a grabbin, it kind of means that uh, we have a pretty shallow source. But now can we quantify it? So here we plotted the dome width. Um, versus the breeder layer thickness, so versus the, the initial depth of the source. And so for different intrusion width. So what you can see is that dome width is actually sensitive to both brittle layer thickness and intrusion width. Whereas if you plot the graben width, then everything plots in the same um, kind of curve, uh, well, uh, line. So graben width is not, is not very sensitive to intrusion width. It is mostly sensitive to brittle layer thickness. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't compared it to geochemistry. Um, because, because you need to have the magma that uh, is beneath the dome and that uh, magma uh, don't really come to the surface very often. But yeah, it would be interesting to compare. So this is a very, well, this, this is because of the, the geometry, which is very, very simple. So you have this slope, and then uh, you can estimate a very, very shallow depth for the Yankee Dome, which would be approximately one kilometer. Well, after that, we've done some uh, numerical modeling uh, with different assumptions in which, uh, so I started uh, here at the end of my PhD, and now uh, I'm collaborating on a paper that should be out soon. Um, so this is, uh, the intrusion of a rigid indenture that was based on the fact that um, mostly intrusions uh, linked to resurgent doming tend to show flat tops. So this is why we, we took this. Uh, 
uh, as a constraint, and then uh, some numerical modeling, so elastic, uh, elastoplastic, sorry, medium, and here, um, and it's here it's a pressure rate cavities with uh, kind of a different, um, different medium uh, that is linked to damage, which uh, I'll talk about in the end of my talk. Anyway, um, what you can see from, so this was from the first type of models, but what you can see, sorry, is that on top of your source, whatever the type of source you get, you have this undeformed uh, wedge here. And so you get a different structure from what the analog model tells you. So here you, you, you kind of also have a wedge, but it's, it's occupied by, by the analog of magma, whereas here it's rock. So of course, uh, from your numerical model estimations, you will have a, a deeper source. But for uh, Yankei, we find something like two kilometers, uh, and in all cases, this is this is very very shallow. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about a, a small example, which I'm working on right now because I'm still uh, working with resurgence, but on Sierra Negra. So Sierra Negra is a volcano in Galapagos, so much simpler tectonic setting. It is a hotspot volcano. So here you have the, so the Galapagos Islands, and the biggest one is, is uh, Isabella, and the biggest volcano of, um, of Isabella is Sierra Negra. This is also the only one that is really accessible if you want to work on, because the only town on this island is a small town, is here, Puerto Villamil. And so what's interesting to see on this, uh, on this volcano is that uh, you can see an asymmetry here on the northern flanks, <clears throat> so the northern flanks is occupied by lava flows, whereas um, the southern flanks is, is very vegetated. So, well, this is, this is because uh, all, recent, well, all recent lava flows were emitted from the northern caldera rim or from the northern flanks, with the exception of this one. But this is also what happened in 2005, and uh, last year into uh, 2018, sorry. And uh, so sometimes the lava will, uh, will flow towards the interior of the caldera, sometimes outward. But in any case, it's always happening on this side of the caldera, and we don't really know why. Uh, our assumption is that it's related to what's going on on the other side of the caldera. Here you can see a false scarp. Uh, so actually, um, here you have this whole block that is tilted and uplifted, and uh, you have, okay, so I'm going to show you the full scarp. It's easier. Okay. So here is a view, so G these are GPS stations, and this is a view approximately from near uh, GPS station 10, looking at this, at this fault system. So you can see like several faults. Actually, it's more taken from there. You can see that you have several floors limiting a block uh, that seems to be uplifted. So just, just a quick footage uh, from, the, from the drone uh, survey missions that we did um, last August and, and uh, September. So this is a drone uh, shooting another drone, actually. <laughs> uh, well, whatever. So you can see the fold extend to the very east of the caldera, and, and the offset gets bigger and bigger when you go towards the, towards the west. So, this, so we went on to, to, the other, uh, to the other drone that was uh, shot. And um, so this is just to show you how it looks in real life. And so here behind it, you have this tilted block with a very gentle slope and then abrupt uh, fold here. So the fault system is, is a little bit, well, it's not complicated, but it's not a single fault. It is several faults like this that are emitting some blocks. And the blocks are, are actually separated by uh, grabbins here. So you have extension all over, like kind of diffuse extension. And of course, you have a lot of uh, hydrothermal uh, feature. Well, not a lot, but quite a lot, yeah. Hydrothermal features along these faults. So we think um, 
that it works a little bit like Ischia. So it would be a kind of trapdoor uh, faulting here uh, with some kind of bending here. And we think this has a relationship with the fact that uh, eruptions are, are taking place right there. Um, so we have extension dust along uh, the rim. And so, so why would we have a fault uh, here? It could be uh, an in inherited fault, actually. Uh, so this is, this is analog modeling of uh, collapse uh, caldera. And uh, this, is, this is numerical modeling, but this is uh, discrete element modeling. It's a little bit like, like uh, little bowls uh, that are linked to each other. And so, so what you see is that during caldera collapse, you actually uh, form two sets of faults. And the first set of fault that you will need to form to accommodate the deformation is a set of outward deeping faults. And then later on, you will, you will form your inward deeping faults. And then when the caldera collapses, the only one that you can see is usually the inward deeping ones. But you still have forms this outward deepings that could be actually reactivated during resurgence. And this is what we think happens in, uh, in Sierra Negra. Now, um, I'm actually <laughs> uh, trying to put together long-term and short-term deformation to resolve the question, uh, which is, uh, well, why do we have uh, eruptions only at the north? And what's the role of this fault system? So it's actually a bit complicated, but we have uh, faulting events uh, before and during eruptions. And there is actually a big controversy right now in the scientific community towards the dip of the fault. So I'm very convinced that it should be a, a, a normal uh, outward deeping fault, but some people think otherwise. So we are comparing different types of models. Uh, so some people do models with just the fault. Uh, I tend to do models with the magmatic source triggering the displacement on the fault, and we are trying to compare uh, what boundary conditions will, uh, will explain our differences. Anyway, this is ongoing work. Let's move on to um, some finished work about short-term uh, short deformation. So I'm going to talk about investigation, investigating volcano interactions. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the story uh, of two neighbors in southern Japan. So Era Caldera, which is famous for its latest cone, which is Sakurajima. And then uh, a volcano located nearby in the Kirishima complex, which is called Chinmoe uh, Dake. So why do we care about uh, volcano interactions first? Well, it's, it's kind of a, a philosophical uh, reason because we don't know if individu individual volcanoes at the surface represent uh, a large magmatic connected system at depth or is it like separated plumbing systems. Um, then we have a practical reason, which is the fact that for eruption forecasting, we need to know the potential impact on any kind of event on our probabilities. Is it going to trigger an eruption or not? Is it going to increase the probability of an eruption or not? So we study volcano interactions. But mostly, we study volcano uh, interactions with uh, other types of events, like, like uh, earthquakes. Uh, so this has been uh, studied quite a lot. Do earthquakes uh, trigger eruptions or not? And then. Uh, Something that is very trendy also with uh, global warming is that the question is ice cap melting uh, able to trigger volcanic eruptions as well. What we uh, have less studied is the influence of a nearby volcanic activity. And so we believe that volcano interactions uh, actually exist because in the geological rec record we find uh, paired eruptions. So eruptions that of nearby volcanoes that uh, happened at the same time. First example would be in New Zealand. So this is in the Topo volcanic zone. So these two calderas here and here are located uh, 30 kilometers apart. And uh, we believe that uh, their, their um, large volume eruption uh, happened pretty much, uh, well, 
almost at the same time. Another, uh, another example is the one that I already talked about in, uh, in San Juan Volcanic Field in Colorado. And uh, so we had concomitant uh, collapse of these two calderas with uh, really interbedded uh, breccias uh, and, and, uh, and, and ignimbrite in both cases. And we also uh, suspect, of course, a lot that we have a big, uh, big common reservoir, as this big common reservoir has been doing some resurgence, some superdome uh, resurgence that I was telling you about earlier. Then, actually, the most famous example of volcano interaction would be in Alaska between Nova Rapta and Katmai. So, so what happened in 1912? So 1912. Um, was the biggest, the largest um, 20th century's uh, volcanic eruptions with the eruptions of 12 cubic kilometers of material from Navarapta. And then at the same time, uh, Katmai uh, was beheaded by a caldera collapse, a large caldera collapse. And how do we know this? Well, we did not uh, witness this directly because uh, of course, it's a volcanic complex, so it was full of clouds, so you cannot see anything. But um, the temporal coincidence was established uh, thanks, for, thanks well, to the, the, the layers that were interbedded and uh, also the interpretation of the seismic record. So what we think happened here was that the reservoir beneath Katmai, um, well, uh, was partly emptied because of a drainage, a lateral drainage towards uh, Nova Rapta. Now, is this really two different volcanoes? Well, maybe some Alaska people can tell me more about it because it looks like a big, big volcano which Nova Rapta could be considered as just a, a lateral vent. Anyway, do we have some recent geodetic evidence? Well, um, that was, there was some, suggest, well, some suggestions uh, that you can find in the literature of a possible interactions between uh, two Hawaiian volcanoes, so Mauna Loa and Kilauea. So this started all because of this article in 2003 was suggested between Vesuvius and uh, Campi Flegrei. And this is from Insar Time Series that was kind of... Uh, early for Insar time series. And uh, it has been uh, criticized a lot uh, from the fact that actually what we interpret as uplift both at uh, Campi Flegrei and Vesuvius that would happen at the same time could be some artifact uh, linked to atmospheric signal that could be big enough to cover the two, the two areas. So let's take a look at what happens in Kyushu Island in southern Japan. So, um, so Kyushu Island is located here. It has uh, two, uh, two clusters of, of uh, active volcanoes. So one is the central volcanic region, one is the southern volcanic regions, and both uh, volcano clusters are actually linked to, to the activity of, of grabbins here. They're linked to the to the general deformation to the back arc extension in Japan. So we're gonna take a look at uh, here Kirishima volcanic complex and here Sakurajima. So Sakurajima uh, is, is, is quite well known and it is uh, actually the latest vent of a caldera called Era Caldera, which you can see here occupies the very end of the Kagoshima Bay. It is located uh, eight kilometers from a very big city of uh, the big city of Kagoshima. And it has had a, a major Plinian eruption in 1914, and uh, which made uh, almost 60 um, uh, death. And, uh, and so it is considered, of course, as a major threat and highly monitored. So this, this Plinian eruption uh, was actually correlated to a a big, well, caldera, well, a, a one meter uh, caldera collapse of the, of the whole like era caldera. And since then, this caldera has been inflating 
and we are now reaching almost the level of the pre uh, pre 1914 eruptions. So people are, are kind of thinking, well, this there might be a giant eruption uh, soon. So, um, but for the last two decades, Era Caldera's inflation has been has been quite steady, actually. It has been inflating at a steady rate. So what we were wondering is that, is this inflation dynamics, was it affected by what happens 20, 22 kilometers up north at Kirishima? So this is the Kirishima group. This is one of the volcano, Shinmuiteke, that did quite a big eruption in 2011. So here, Kirishima is actually a group of 20 volcanoes, and Shinmoideke is, is um, an active volcano. But it, before uh, 2011, it had been quiet for uh, 300 years. So this is what happened in 2011. So um, we had some precursory activity. So we had a pre-eruptive pre inflation from December 2000. Uh, 9 to January, uh, to the beginning of the eruption. So this was approximately one year inflation before the eruption. And then the, the eruption began, uh, so here you have a, a picture, began as, uh, with a very, very strong phase. So during a few days, you had a lot of magma that was extruded. And uh, so we, it started with free magmatic event, then a series of subplanian events, and then uh, the extrusion of a lava dome. But uh, a major extrusion there happens in just a few days. And then during later stages, it was less explosive, but uh, there was a renewed inflation, like a recharge of the edifice. So <clears throat> now we're going to look at GPS. And uh, so here is Hiroshima Volcanoes. Here is our volcano. Here is uh, a GPS baseline here in, uh, in black. And what you can see is different phase. So before, uh, before December 2009, nothing happens. And then you start inflating. Uh, <clears throat> so I said one year, it's actually two years. Uh, so then, no, it's one year, whatever. Uh, so you have this pre-eruptive inflation and then this, this drop, and then this recharge that is approximately concomitant with the, with the eruption here in, in, uh, in pink. And then uh, you go back to, to quiet. So in the same time, at the same time, what happens at Era Caldera, you have a bunch of, um, of uh, GPS uh, baselines here. And so you can see the general inflation trend, but you can see a very well correlated episode during, uh, during Hiroshima recharge, recharge uh, stage. And so you can see either uh, it is flat or it is the length is decreasing, which means uh, we, have, we have a general deflation of the, of the caldera that was um, correlated to this, to this recharge phase. So what we wanted to do is, is get an idea about the volumes so what we did is uh, we did uh, look at the, at the GPS displacement to invert it uh, to try and get an idea about the volume. So we decided to take three sources, one for Kirishima, uh, one for Era Caldera, and one uh, for uh, Sakurajima, because this is what is, uh, what is generally uh, found in the literature. And so... We inverted for the, the, the volume change in the sources. And um, so what we found, if we, so I, I just want to say that as we used several sources, we were forced to use uh, a fin finite element modeling. Because then otherwise, with analytical modeling, uh, you're not taking into account the interactions, the possible interactions within, between the sources. So I just wanna, want you to take a look at time period two versus time period four. So time period two was the pre-eruptive inflation and time period four is the recharge. So during the pre-eruptive inflation here, 
we, so we have a, a, an inflation of Kirishima and also an inflation at Era Caldera, which is actually a bit stronger than usual. And then when you look at the recharge event at Kirishima, which is approximately the same rate as uh, the pre-eruptive inflation, uh, you, you, you change completely your dynamic at Era Caldera and then you get a deflation. So why, why in this case we have both, uh, both reservoirs inflating and why in this case one is inflating and uh, the other one is deflating? Well, so we've investigated uh, a few possible mechanisms, and we can rule out the direct, uh, direct compression, uh, for example, linked to this, uh, to this um, reservoir dynamics. And what we think is the, the best explanation that satisfies the observation is actually, so the two phases are quite similar for, uh, for Kirishima, but what happened in between is this eruption climax. So period two would be some magmatic pulse, uh, mostly directed towards Kirishima, though Era Caldera also had uh, a bigger inflation during this period. So we had a, a magmatic pulse common to the, to the two uh, edifices. And then when you, when, you, when you get your eruption, then you're gonna deflate suddenly your, uh, your reservoir, so you have a pressure drop and then a very high uh, pressure gradient here that will redirect, uh, redirect the flux. So to answer the questions, is nearby activity uh, a factor that can uh, increase or decrease your eruption probabilities? Well, I would say that uh, when we see this inflation here, if it's pre-eruptive inflation, that it might mean common pulse. So yeah, you might have more chances of getting a, a, an eruption here. If it's post-eruptive uh, inflation and recharge, then for a couple of months, you're gonna lower your eruption pr probabilities in the nearby volcano. All right, let's move on to the last part of this talk, which is uh, a few slides about what I'm doing here at Carnegie. So this is about uh, damage modeling. This is about the evolution of the crust and the edifice mechanical properties. And so, well, what was the motivation for that is that if you look at, a, a, at an experiment of a deformation of a rock sample, what happens is, okay, so you're gonna deform your rock, but what also happens is that you're gonna form a series of, of little cracks inside your rock sample. So you can, actually know it because you hear some noise, you hear the cracking. And if you, wanna, if you wanna monitor the acoustic signal, you can even locate the cracks inside your rock sample. And so you increase the density as you increase the load on your sample. And then finally what happens is that all the cracks are gonna interact and localize in a certain uh, geometry, and then you will nucle nucleate a fault. So this is what happens when you deform a rock sample. So why is it relevant? Because all these micro cracks actually have an effect on the properties of the rock. And uh, so here in the x-axis, let's say that we have the equivalent of, uh, of the increase of the density of the micro cracks, or we would say like increasing damage. And uh, what you can see is that you will lower as you increase your micro crack density, you will lower the strength of your rock. So the strength is the value that kind of characterize how your rock will resist failure. So it will fail more easily. And then uh, you're, also, you're also affecting the, the elastic properties because you're, you're lowering the Young's modulus of your rock. And so the, Young model, the Young's modulus is the proportionality coefficient between stress and strain. So if you lower your, um, your elastic modulus, then what happens is that with the same stress, you will get more strain. So your rock is becoming more and more soft as it is loaded. So how can we take this into account uh, in the case of volcanoes? Well, we kind of believe that the failure process is uh, sort of scale independent and that the same type of things happens in volcanoes. 
So here you have a shallow reservoir that is undergoing um, pressure changes. And this pressure changes will, will, will of course, uh, reflect in the deformation that you can measure at the surface. But it, it's also going to create a lot of cracks inside uh, your edifice. And these cracks, we believe, is, is mostly the source for a volcano tectonic seismicity. So our strategy here is to use seismicity to try and estimate the change in elastic parameters. And then from these elastic parameters and the deformation, we can go back to uh, the um, changes in pressure inside, inside the reservoir. So for that, uh, we wanted to, to run like a systematic studies on a series of eruptions to see if we have some systematic patterns. And so we chose to, to, to study um, Piton de la Fournaise volcano. So it is an ideal target because it is, it is very active. So Piton de la Fournaise volcano is located here in the Indian Ocean on Reunion Island. It's also a hotspot, basaltic uh, edifice. And it has produced uh, 43 uh, eruptions between 1998 and uh, 2017 which you can add uh, actually to like uh, four eruptions uh, this, uh, the last year in 2018. And so it is also very well monitored with a lot of GPS stations, a lot of seismic stations, and the uh, beginning of permanent GPS monitoring began in 2003, 2004. So this is the typical signal that you get uh, from uh, during an interruptive period. So here you will see the seismicity, uh, accumulated uh, volcano tectonic uh, events, and then, and then here the deformation in the sense, in the, um, in the form, sorry, of a GPS baseline across the summit. And what you'll see is, is a nice acceleration of both signals preceding the eruption, and then here, uh, here is the rupture. And so uh, we believe this correlation uh, is, is, is due to, to, is made through, through the modification of elastic parameters. So what I was saying is that uh, we're going to use seismicity, so the number of events, to characterize the change in the elastic properties. So here I'm going to be talking about the uh, shear modulus, so I'm, I'm not going to go through these equations, don't worry. But this is the general expression for the evolution of the, um, of the shear modulus. You see that it depends on the initial shear modulus. It also depends on some incremental damage factor and then on the, on the number of, of uh, VT events. So we could take directly, we could take this number directly from the curve that I showed you. Or uh, if we want to make things uh, sim simpler for us, uh, we can try and find an expression for the cumulative uh, seismicity. So I'm not going to go through the details, but we have some very convenient uh, properties of the seismicity, which give us uh, uh, a simple law from the, from the number of the cumulative number of VT events, and then we can find uh, a simple expression for the time evolution of the, of the shear modulus. The aim of all this is to be able to resolve a differential equation for the pressure inside this uh, reservoir. So what I was saying is that when you get a simple expression, then you can resolve it analytically which is, which is easier than the numerical resolution, but both can be done. And uh, so I've, I've start, started doing it on, a, um, on several um, <clears throat> interu interruptive periods that were quite simple. And this is just a few results from uh, individual uh, periods. So it looks, it's typically, uh, it looks like this. So you fit the, the number of events and then your deformation and then uh, you, can, you can get, so this is the normalized pressure and this is the normalized flux towards the, the, the reservoir. So basically, uh, just what I want to point out is two, we have two phases. We have this first phase here, uh, which, is, which is what we call the elastic phase in which we don't really feel the changes in the elastic parameters. 
And so you have an increase of the pressure inside your reservoir. And because you decrease the gradient, then you will decrease the, the flux inside your reservoir. And then you have this plastic phase, actually, or brittle phase, in which you have a, a slow and progressive modification of your elastic property. So we're investigating this part to see if we have something systematic that happens right before uh, eruption. So we are comparing plastic phase right now, phases right now. But we are also comparing elastic phases because as we have the displacement and we model the, um, the changes in pressure, we can kind of um, uh, plot some sort of equivalent of stress strain uh, curves. And this is, this, this is uh, part of the results. And so what we have studied before 2007 all plot uh, approximately on the same curve. And then we, we seem to see a major change uh, that happened in 2007 with a change in the, in the elastic modulus. The edifice would become more rigid that we could explain uh, together with the frequency, the frequency of, of eruptions. And then, so what happened in 2007 is that we had a very, very major uh, eruption with a caldera collapse. And so the fact that we emptied part of the reservoir uh, well, the result was that we didn't have that many eruptions after that. So the, the edifice has had more time to heal between eruptions. Whereas before, we have the softer edifice because the fact that, that we had some repeated eruptions all the time, then you, you, get, you maintain a, a, a damage level. And then, then when you lower your frequencies, then, then your... your um, edifice becomes steeper. After 2015, uh, we had, uh, again, a lot of eruptions. And we seem to see, uh, again, a decrease in the, in the, in the elastic properties of the, in the elastic modules of, of our edifice. This is, well, we have to be very cautious about this. This is very preliminary results, and we're still working on it. So just to finish up uh, with, uh, uh, answering the title of this talk. So what can we do with volcano deformation? Uh, one, one strategy is to, to assume that we know the mechanical properties of the shallow crust and of the edifice, and then we try to uh, constrain either the shape, the location of the sources, or we try to constrain the change in pressure, in volumes. Or uh, the second strategy is to try and consider deformation episodes and eruptions as like um, life scale like experiments and then try to infer uh, the shallow crust and the mechanical properties of, of the edifice. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So if, if that's true, why, I mean, how does that relate to the forces of the Unless you're trying to model the forces of an of a inflating magnet. Yeah, so um, actually, OK, so I did not explain that. But so it's the geometry of the, OK. So let's try and so see. Yeah. OK, so the geometry is like that. So we have some lateral compression, but from behind. And then the geometry, the whole geometry, transforms this lateral compression into, into something vertical. This is just because it's, it's much easier to compress from the side than compressing exactly from, uh, from beneath. But so we, we tried. Yeah, so what we did is that we started by uh, doing that without sand to, to observe what was, was, was happening here and that we, we really had uh, kind of a, a flat uh, uplift of the roof of the, the silicone reservoir. Yeah. 
So I don't know. I, I have to look at magnitudes right now. All I had uh, to work with during the, the first few months was just the, um, just just the number of the daily number of events, and now I wanna I wanna include the magnitude because, okay, this is relevant for what you mentioned, and this is yeah this is also relevant for uh, actually. Okay, so. Yeah. So, no. This factor is something that we fit, but in a certain range, and it depends on the characteristics of the seismicity. And actually, it depends on the, the average uh, magnitude. So now, we could also change this with time, according to 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 the evolution of of, uh, of magnitude, like daily average magnitude, something like that. Because the magnitude is linked to to the surface that ruptures, and the more surface, sorry, the more surface you rupture, the more you're gonna affect your elastic properties. So yeah. So, so the problem is uh, 